Hello, my name is Dr. Anthony Kiefer. I'm an adjunct associate professor at James Cook University in Townsville. I'm also a consultant at North Coast Veterinary Specialist and Referral Centre on the Sunshine Coast. Our topic for today is a new approach to tooth extractions and the concept of atraumatic tooth extractions. This is brought to you by IM3, the veterinary dental company. And I thank them for inviting me to give this webinar. Back in 2012 in veterinary record, uh, an editorial looked at the benefits of invasive or less invasive veterinary surgical procedures and what are the benefits. And they discussed this in the editorial and they saw that we could have less patient morbidity with these types of minimally invasive procedures, short, shortened durations of hospitalization and reduced wound contamination and breakdown. So overall a better outcome for the patient. Minimally invasive techniques are not new. Um, they've been used for many, many years in human cardiology, gastroenterology and orthopedic surgery. Um, as you can see from the arthroscopic uh, surgical view on the right hand side there. They've been shown to lead to less pain, faster wound healing for the patient and in this case, in the uh, orthopedic cases, shorter hospital stays as well. So in this webinar we're going to look at mechanical principles of tooth extraction. How does an extraction site heal? Why do we want to perform atraumatic or minimally invasive uh, surgical, or, sorry, minimally invasive extraction procedures? And what's currently available out there for extraction techniques that are considered minimally invasive? So the three mechanical principles for tooth extraction, number one is the expansion of the bony socket. And this is where the tooth is actually used as a dilating instrument. So this, very early in the piece, forceps are placed on the tooth and the forceps maneuver the tooth um, to expand the alveolus. Now this is done a lot in human dentistry, but not that much in veterinary dentistry. The second principle is the use of a lever and a fulcrum to force the tooth root out of the socket. Uh, and this is where we use elevators and the fulcrum is the bone and we apply a leverage force to the tooth to lever it out of the socket. The third concept or principle is the insertion, insertion of a wedge uh, such as a luxator to create space between the root and the bony socket ball. Uh, and so luxators cut through the periodontal ligament and create space for us. With a surgical extraction, we raise a mucoperiosteal flap and we remove some bone to allow us to deliver the tooth via trans, trans alveolar approach. Now, how does an extraction site heal? Extraction sites heal similar to secondary intention healing. So you can see very important after the tooth has been extracted, we get a good clot formation. So the clot is very important in starting the healing of the extraction socket. With the clot formation, we get inflammatory cells and chemokines coming in. And with this, we get angiogenesis or blood vessels growing into the clot. Following the angiogenesis is a migration of mesenchymal, mesenchymal stem cells, and these include fibroblasts and osteoblasts. So eventually we get bone formation within the extraction socket. And after that, osteoclasts come in to remodel this bone. And this can take up to 21 days. Why do we want to perform minimally invasive procedures when we're looking at tooth extractions? We'll go through some of the reasons. So when we raise a mucoperiosteal flap, do we cause any pain in our patient? Now the studies that have been looking at this are mainly human dental studies. So one of the studies looked at 
extraction of mandibular third molar teeth. So these are commonly extracted uh, in younger patients. And they looked at the degree of difficulty of the extraction from a less difficulty involving the use of forceps only up to complex extractions where flaps were raised, bone was removed and roots were sectioned. And in this study, they found that post-operative pain um, was more significant in those situations where a more difficult surgical approach was performed. So in patients, the patients were assessing their level of pain from zero to 10. <clears throat> on, on, on that score, uh, they found that the more uh, complex the procedure, the more post-operative pain. So pain increased with increasing difficulty of surgery, especially those, those surgeries that involved the raising of a mucoperiosteal flap and removal of bone. Other studies have compared two flap designs. So comparing a surgical triangular flap where a flap is raised and bone is removed compared to an envelope flap where no bone is removed. And they found that even though there was no difference in periodontal healing or complications, but 30% of the surgical extraction, so the surgical triangular flap cases, um, resulted in more debilitating post-operative pain for the patients. Another study comparing flap and flapless groups, uh, again with mandibular third molar extractions, showed that uh, when we looked at pain response and swelling, that the patients that had the flapped uh, approach had more pain than the patients that had the flapless approach. And not only that, the, the pain persisted for longer in the patients that had the flapped approach compared to the flapless approach. And also swelling, um, the flapped approach caused more swelling than in the flapless approach. So you can start to see that by raising a mucoperiosteal flap that we are going to, and removing bone, we're going to experience, experience more morbidity in our patients, or at least in human patients, but we could extrapolate this to veterinary patients. The conclusion of this study suggested that <clears throat> the use of the flapless procedure to remove partially impacted third molars significantly decreased post-operative pain swelling um, compared to the flap procedure. So the consensus, at least amongst human oral surgeons, is that when we raise a mucoperiosteal flap, the patient will experience more pain and swelling than when a flap is not raised. So just keep that in the back of your mind. What about wound closure? Are there any differences between primary closure or leaving part of the extraction site open? or secondary intention healing. Well, one of the studies that was done uh, several years ago, back in 2014, looked at the extraction, the healing of extraction sites in monkeys. Uh, and they extracted the third molar tooth here, uh, and they left the extraction site open, as you can see in D here. And these animals were recovered uh, and then they were fed their normal soft or they were fed a soft diet for the first few days and then they went back onto their normal diet of fruits and cooked vegetables. And what they found in this study was the healing of all extraction sockets in all of these monkeys was uneventful and no infections developed during the observation period. So in this situation, an extraction socket left open was still going to heal normally. Another study looked at the differences between uh, primary closure, primary closure here on, in A, compared to um, closure, but leaving the extraction socket open. So you can see a flap's been raised in both, but here the uh, extraction site has been closed. In this one, it's been left open. And what they found in this study is, is that there was less pain and swelling associated with B, where the extraction site was left open. This is a case of mine. Um, this is uh, where I use the vet tome to extract tooth 204 here. You can see there's a pulp exposure here. So we have a periodontally sound tooth. And we've used the vet tome 360 degrees around this tooth to extract the tooth. 
you can see the photograph on the right hand side, this is eight days post extraction. So eight days, you can see that the labial plates intact. We have some sutures here and the wound looks very healthy. Uh, and the extraction site, the extraction socket is healing with secondary intentional healing. So this is a very good outcome. We've got four bony walls around this uh, extraction site and we've got a nicely healed um, extraction site and this patient le uh, needed less post-operative pain relief because of this. When we compare this to uh, a normal approach, so the normal approach in a surgical extraction of the canine tooth would be to raise a rhomboidal flap. So we do a vertical release in front of the canine tooth, a horizontal release, and then a distal cord, uh, or caudal uh, vertical release here. So we've raised our flap then we'll remove around 70% of the bone overlying the root of that tooth. So you can see with this approach, um, the degree of morbidity is much higher than the vet tome approach. So what is the most popular mechanical dental luxator in the veterinary marketplace? Well, I've already mentioned it. Uh, it is the vet tome. Uh, it's made by IM3. Now, how does the vet tome work? You can see the vet tome here on the right hand side. The tip, the, bl the blade here, or the tip, moves one millimeter in a forward direction. The chuck and the solenoid sits in this component of the vet tome, and that the solenoid pushes the uh, chuck assembly up by a millimeter. Now, the power setting here can be adjusted, and the force of the movement of the tip. Um, is, uh, is increases as the power setting goes up. So this, when we get to a, a 10, so this goes from zero or one to 10, uh, at a 10, the, the, the force of the tip movement upwards is the maximum. Now the solenoid being away from the blade doesn't create any heat. So there's no heat production. So you can actually hold this tip and there will not be any heat production when the unit is in function. So there's no risk of heating bone at, at all. Also the tip is flexible and this allows it to follow curvature of roots, especially when we're dealing with canine teeth. The tips are also very long, so 40 millimeters. They're the longest tips that are available with any mechanical periotome or mechanical luxator. And these are ideal for canine teeth. What are the benefits with dental extractions with using the vet tome. Well, we're going to see, we're gonna remove little or no alveolar bone, so that's a benefit, so less morbidity with that. We're not raising a mucoperiosteal flap. Remember that the mucoperiosteum supplies some of the blood supply to the underlying bone. So we're not, um, not only are we not affecting the blood supply to our flap, but we're also not affecting the blood supply to the underlying bone as we've mentioned here, there's less interruption to the blood supply. With little or no bone removal, we reduce the morbidity to the patient, as you could see in the studies on the mandibular third molar extractions in humans. Also, we're preserving the four walls of the socket. So we're preserving the four walls of the socket. So the labial plates preserved, the palatal and the mesial and distal plates in this uh, um, upper jaw are preserved. And this allows us to place a bone graft if we need to. So from this, and because the, the procedure is usually shorter than a surgical procedure, we're not raising a flap, we're not removing bones, so we can work a lot quicker with the vet tome, we're going to reduce our overall anesthetic time. So not only are we reducing the morbidity to the patient, but we're actually shortening the anesthetic time with the use of the vet tome. What are the contraindications for the use of the vet tome? Well, if there's any evidence of ankylosis, and this can be seen in certain types of tooth resorptions, uh, or in those animals that have abnormal chewing behavior. So they're chewing on bones and rocks. Um, and with that, you get loss or scarring of the periodontal ligament. So in this situation, the vet tome won't be able to follow the periodontal ligament space. So that's how it works. It follows the periodontal ligament space. So it doesn't dig into the tooth. It doesn't dig into the surrounding bone. It actually follows 
the space around the tooth to, to allow you to introduce an elevator once the vet tome has created that space. It also may not work that well in teeth that are very curved, in really dilacerated teeth. But in mandibular canines, it works very well. And in maxillary canines, it works very well. As, and also in the carnassial teeth as well. So here we have a video of the vet tome in use. We're using it on a lower 304 here, mandibular canine tooth. We can use it 360 degrees around the tooth and even onto the labial plate here. Once we've done that, we've used some elevators. You can see that the tooth now is mobile. You can see some movement in the tooth root. And now we're going to apply forceps to the crown of the tooth and the root of the tooth to apply a force to assist us in the extraction of this tooth. So we're applying forceps. This tooth curves caudally, so it means that it wants to come out to the caudal, to the distal. You can see there. So here's the same patient, uh, approximately um, eight days post extraction. So you can see a photograph here. This is in the conscious patient of the wound healing that's occurring post extraction using the vet tome. So you can see the labial plate still intact. Um, we can just place some stay sutures uh, and keep our blood clot intact. So we're getting good secondary intention healing in this area. And these will go to, on to heal uneventfully. Finally, this is a video of an extraction of tooth 104 in a five-year-old greyhound. And we're using the vet tome because we want to be minimally invasive with this procedure. You can see that we've got a very wide pulp canal in this tooth so that there's pulp necrosis occurring. This dog may have had uh, fibrinolytic syndrome, so we're giving it some trans transexamic acid. You're reducing the height of the crown. So you can always reduce the height of the crown of the tooth to assist you with the extraction process. And this allows the vet tome blade to get close to the apex of the tooth. So we're going to work at around 360 degrees. So we're starting in a rocking action, working down along the root, between the root and the bone. And this working on the distal side here. And then we're going to work on the palatal side of the tooth, you can see here. You can see there's some curvature in the, in the tip following the root curvature. And then we can also apply it onto the labial side of the tooth. So we're coming back onto the, onto the mesial side here. The blade can also be applied onto the labial side. You can see that it runs between the labial plate of bone following the periodontal ligament. So we can actually um, preserve the labial plate, but get in underneath the labial plate. Now we're using elevators on the mesial side to apply a leverage force to the tooth. So we're levering against the palatal plate of bone here. And we're gonna start to get some movement in this tooth. And we're just going to apply our elevator on the distal side. We're going to get some movement on the distal side. Once we're getting good movement in this tooth, we can apply forceps to this. So here we have our extraction forceps. We're going in a rostral caudal direction because the tooth is oval in cross section. So it accepts those types of forces. And then we're going to extract the tooth, you can see here, uh, there's a little bit of tearing of the, muc uh, the mucosa there. See, it's quite a long route there. And then we're going to flush, uh, curette out the socket to make certain there's no debris there and flush with saline and then we're ready to suture. So we're just using a 4-0 absorbable suture here, something like Vicryl uh, and uh, an absorbable suture. And we're just basically closing um, the uh, palatal and labial mucosa over the socket. Uh, so 
you can see there, and that preserves the blood clot. And here's a post-operative extract um, radiograph of the extraction site. I'd like to thank the Vet Expo team and also very importantly, IM3, the veterinary dental company who brought out the vet tome into the veterinary market. Um, if you want to watch or see, get more additional resources, including videos on the use of the vet tome, please go to im3vet.com.au. Thank you. My name is Dr. Anthony Kiefer and I thank you again for watching this webinar.